What's going on analysts? Welcome to the first episode of our All About Analysis YouTube channel, where we talk about all things crime analysis. Our mission, to help cultivate your knowledge, understanding, and confidence as law enforcement analysts. We interview fellow analysts, investigators, commanders, and industry experts to provide you with the insights and valuable tips to help you in your journey to becoming an exceptional analyst. Our guests provide an inside look at their approach to crime analysis. You'll also get a glimpse at the challenges and politics our guests have endured. We'll find out what they find so rewarding about their job. Our brief tips and tutorial segment is designed to improve your skills, making you efficient leveraging your analytical software. So make sure you stick around to the end. This channel is not for everyone, but if you're a crime analyst or remotely interested in a career in the field, or you're intrigued by the description you just heard, Click that subscribe button and hit that bell so you don't miss any of our new episodes. Now let's go ahead and get started. Today's guest is Rob Tajdi, a retired Toronto police officer with over 29 years of dedicated service. Having served in various uniform and investigative roles in the Major Crime Unit, Asian Crime Task Force, and Homicide Squad, Rob will share some of his most memorable experiences as a crime analyst. Rob occasionally lectured at the Toronto Police College on the subject of search warrants and operational planning. Rob has also gained national recognition for his creation of the youth outreach program called Music Not Mischief. Retiring in 2018, he spends his days running and enjoying the products of his Poetic Justice Coffee Company, riding his Harley, training in jiu-jitsu, and training with his canine companion, Musashi. Rob has a reputation for being articulate, outspoken, and a national newspaper described him as a self-possessed and highly literate and tattooed officer. Never at a loss for words, Rob will surely enlighten us on his experience as an analyst practitioner and his views on the present challenges facing crime analysis today. Rob, thanks for some of your time and welcome to the channel. Thanks, Manny. For you, anything. Tell us how you got started in crime analysis. What did you expect to be doing? In 2007, I got invited to come into analysis work. The, uh, the, the outgoing analyst was, was moving on to something else. And uh, um, also at the same time, there was an arson series going on in, in 14 Division where I was working, uh, which in a Toronto-esque uh, landscape is the, the division immediately west of the downtown core from uh, Parkdale in the west to Chinatown in the east. Um, there was this arson series going on, and they asked me to come in to be the analyst just for this the, for the arson task force that they struck to to figure that stuff out. Um, I worked that arson. That can be something we talk about later. Um, moved into the analyst role and uh, and had the opportunity to work some really great great cases. And um, uh, I don't know if I was ever a spectacular copper. But what I do know is I had some spectacular opportunities that came my way and, uh, and, and made them into a couple of good cases. So um, I stayed at 14 uh, in 2012, 11, 2011, 2012. I went uh, to 11 Division where I took over the role as analyst there. And uh, that's where I finished my career. Uh, in the meantime, while I was doing the analysis stuff, I, I started... Um, this youth outreach program, which probably became the thing that, um, other than operations, I was best known for, uh, a program called Music Not Mischief. The old website, musicnotmischief.com, is still up. It was a guitar-oriented youth outreach program. I ran that for 10 years and got a bit of media off of that as well. When you first came into crime analysis, what did you think you were going to do? And having ended your career as an analyst, was it anything like you thought it would be? Yeah. Um, so... I'm thinking back around 1991, I was a foot patrolman, and uh, we had this, uh, this, this old veteran copper who was the crime analyst, um, and he was one of the first ones. At least that's how it was sold to me. And he had this little dank corner in the office, and so his setup was, was basically working through a bunch of Cardex files. And what he did um, as, a, as an old analyst, and he, and he knew his streets, and he knew his bad guys, um, but he would take every day, you know, we'd arrest people and all of the paperwork would go get coded downtown. And then, um, the ident bureau, which was downtown at the headquarters would send back to the analyst, all the, the mugshot pictures of the, the daily bad guys. And he would take them and he would make Cardex, put them in his Cardex file 
and and every bad guy would get this code. I think it was like an eight digit code between like gender, um, skin color, uh, height, build, and 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 these things. So if you ever needed the analyst and say, uh, hey, tell me, um, you know, who do you know who's a a, a male white with a medium build uh, who's doing robberies, and and he'd be able to sort of go through a partial code and then go through his Cardex file and and say, well, how about this guy? Um, and, and so that's what crime, crime analysis was. And it, it was interesting to me. And I, I sat with the guy for a couple of days just to sort of hit, figure his shtick out. But, but then, you know, I got caught up in all the, the sexy stuff of policing. I um, transitioned out of uniform. I went into the investigative side, uh, apprenticed in the detective office, went into major crime, did, uh, you know, again, was really lucky, had great partners, did some good undercover work, started doing some major case stuff. And then um, I, I parachuted from there off to Asian crime, which was just a fascinating eye opener. And from there, back to the de- detective office, some seconded to homicide for a little while. And um, uh, so, come 2007, um, I was looking to, to change it up, looking for some stability. My daughter had come to live with me, and 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 this, I'm, I'm going to revisit this because I'm as guilty of it as a lot of crime analysts. Um, I looked for for a, a steady gig. And I got the steady gig. But the difference was where I was looking to take care of, a, of an adolescent daughter. Um, a lot, I think, of our food group is analysts and, and, and where our, our calling seems to fall down in that, um, you know, we, we do great work, but we have bad PR. I think we have some some real weak links in analysis. And, and the job tends to attract misfits people looking for accommodation, whether they're old, whether they need maternity or, or, or they come off maternity, whether they need child care at home and they're looking for that stability. I was the same thing. Difference was, was I had just come out of, um, you know, a, a decade of some really, really rich um, experience that even in the context of the Toronto police was unique. Um, you know, in 1999, I did two months of a, of a quasi deep cover role where I was living in this hotel for um, for every day for two months, you know, buying dope and, and, and chat of prostitutes. And there was a, the, the drug element, there was a morality element to it. Um, but nobody was doing deep cover inserts then anymore. And it was only by virtue of the fact that I had a partner who, who knew how to do it because he was an old drug squad guy. He forgot more about undercover work than I'd ever known. Um, and, and so I got lucky, right? Um, so once again, I've got this background and now I'm sitting behind a computer um, working off of map info, you know, making points on a map and thinking, okay, so what? Going back to that arson series I was talking about, this this is where it became different because, as you know, um, there are a whole lot of analysts out there, and if you said to them, hey, listen, I need you to strap on a gun and go for a walk out there out in the jungle and tell me what you see, you know, bring some context to the data, it's like, <laughs> What? Or even now in a world of civilian analysis or civilian analysts, you know, they, they don't even have the capacity to see a crime scene, speak to a bad guy or know the streets and the, the intimate ways that, that you and I got a chance to do it. And, and for just for anybody else who knows Manny San Pedro, which is a new Manny San Pedro, that guy was a legend as well when it came to um, we were alumnists in Asian crime and um, he had a pretty badass reputation, too. So don't think that he's just the tech guy at the other end. He, this guy was an operational cop. Um, hey, if you're getting value out of this video, can you smash that like button? That mean the world to us. Now, let's get back to the interview. But. Uh, so the first thing was with these these three analysis or the, these three arson series. The first thing I said is, all right, I'm I'm going to go out on the road. I'm going to go see what I see. And uh, I get to the very first point, which is coded on Shaw Street to the east, right in the back alley behind this address on Shaw Street. So I go to the back alley and I take a look. And the first thing I notice when I look over to the to the to the west that there's this great big house that's been completely demoed. It's down on the frame, right? It's under construction. So going to look for some witnesses, I go over and I talk to these construction guys that are in this, in this reno. And I said, hey, um, uh, incidentally, too, there was a guy in custody now. I'm reverse engineering the profile, which we're not supposed to do technically, but uh, I'll show you how this all shook down and, and why getting on the street as an analyst is important. So I go talk to the construction guys. I say, hey, um, the fire over there, you guys know anything about it? And they start chatting me up and telling me that, uh, that they've been having this chronic problem with this, this, uh, this black guy who is the suspect, who is in custody. And um, 
that uh, that he was stealing the copper tubing that they were using for the plumbing out of this construction site. So they got all pissed off at him, and they they told him, you know, you know, beat feet, get out of here. And it was that night that he came back and he set that fire in the laneway right behind that construction site. And then from there, I just follow the timeline of the ten or a dozen, thirteen different fires that go through this this timeline. And um, the uh, as I follow through. We get to the scene of one fire, and there's a, 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 a witness who identifies the suspect there, describes him as male black, carrying a jerry can of gasoline, which he had got from one of the nearby sheds. And he's wearing this red T-shirt with the word security written on it in white lettering. And I follow the scene through, and he keeps going north. He sets fire to a car, a big, expensive luxury car, burns down on a driveway. And he gets in behind um, a grocery store up near DuPont and Christie Street in Toronto. And as I get in behind that, I find that there's a campsite um, in behind the grocery store by the railroad tracks. Now, the important thing to this is the suspect was arrested at another one of these fire scenes. He was um, at a railside campsite down in Parkdale near Dufferin and Florence Street. And so he's arrested in this campsite where he's living. And what had happened, there was a construction site right at the corner, the southeast corner of Dunda, or, um, Dufferin and Florence. Is it Dufferin? Brock. Uh, Brock Street in Florence. Um, a bunch of townhouses got built there. And so the construction guys in that, in that site caught the guy stealing stuff out of the construction site. So they confronted him. He came back later and used, um, used an accelerant, and he set fire to this townhouse complex, and he's later arrested at this railside campsite. So now we've got similar fact in two different series, right? And so I'm thinking, oh, I did good. I'm, I'm, I'm linking this stuff up really good, right? So I run back to the station, and, uh, and I go talk to the unit commander, and the unit commander's like, oh, he's already solved it. It's all like, ah. So she actually throws me her car keys, you know, straps. She's got her nice pressed white shirt on, straps the scrambled eggs on her hat, and, and, and I drive her down to um, the, the Brock Street site where the guy was pinched. And the investigator's there. Now, the investigator... He was in my recruit class. We knew each other for a long time. And, uh, and he made his bones off this case. <laughs> it's funny. I actually have the investigative chronology still upstairs on the data stick. But, um, and, uh, and so the unit commander gets in there. She grabs a pair of gloves from, from one of the uniforms there, straps on, and she starts going through these garbage bags from this crime scene. And in one of the garbage bags, what does she do? She pulls out the red T-shirt with security on the front of it that the officer in charge never even bothered checking the site for any, of, any other evidence, right? The third series, as we were digging through it, um, was just a bunch of garbage can fires until it ended up at a, at a, at a lumber yard or some sort of an industrial site um, where the guy set this huge fire of all this lumber that was, was sitting there. Um, it started off in Liberty Village down in the south end of Toronto near the CNE grounds. And it turns out when we interviewed the, the, um, the woman who was at the very first fire scene, she said, yeah, no, I know him. He's a homeless guy, and he was staying here. I was letting him stay in the stairwell, and uh, the landlord confronted him and kicked him out. And then he set this reactionary fire series until he got to the big one that all blazed up. So we linked these, th- or I-, I provided the theory to link all of these three together. He was in custody for the one fire, and um, he ended up uh, pleading guilty after staying in custody for the one fire, he was actually never charged up for the second two series. But, um, but the, the point of my comment and all of that was that um, if it, the uniform guys, they go out and they take a report. And if, if an address on Shaw Street calls a fire in the laneway, then what do they do? They go there, and especially now that so much of the, the computerized reporting is, is all auto-populated from the radio calls. Um, they go there and it's like, oh, well, we got a call to um, 123 ABC Street and that's where the fire was. So 123 ABC Street fire in the back laneway. But that address, the originating address, had nothing to do with the actual series. And without getting into the series, without going and seeing what there is to see from the offender's standpoint and without following the befores and the afters and getting out to that rail side track to put all of the similar fact together, there's... Nothing, right? It just becomes a bunch of coded data with no meaning, right? That was a good series. I remember it well. It's a great success story. I want to shift gears for a bit. Any challenges or disappointments you're willing to share? 
I got to this point where where what I was seeing, you know, the the information I was throwing back into the machine um, to say, hey, we should do this or we shouldn't do that or we could better invest resources in this direction as opposed to that direction um, weren't being listened to anymore. And um, and you know there there's there was a lot of politicking. I suppose there's always been a lot of politicking, but um, you know we've we've come to this this point in life where there's been this massive generation or, or social paradigm shift. And so um, I, I would love to do this with the idea that maybe some analyst somewhere will say, hey, you know those two old farts, maybe they know something, maybe I should listen. There was a guy who we worked with at 11 Division, who you know, who I'm not going to mention here, who came out yesterday. And uh, um, he brought a radar gun, we put the dog on the radar, and we were tracking the dog, and he, he's, a, he's a good coffee customer, my, my fledgling coffee company. And, um, and he, he's very fond of saying, he said, you called this 2020 thing. <laughs> and it's like, you know what? It was the analysis. They taught me how to think. They ha- th- taught me how to read the data, to read the tea leaves, to do the voodoo, to see clearly. And I said, yeah, no, I'm getting out of here. So that, that was that. Um, I want to get your opinion on this. TPS civilianizing the crime analysts. Our team at the analysis support section originally discussed teaming up qualified civilian analysts with sworn analysts. I think it worked well in our office. Each one can learn from each other and both end up becoming better analysts. This might also break down the sworn versus civilian obstacle out in the field. It made sense at the time. Think of the benefits. What's your take? Let let, let me add this, okay? And and, um, I I think there's a couple of things to it because I I know that there are a lot of analysts who might end up seeing this, especially the young ones in Toronto now, this new group of civilian analysts. And there were a couple of good civilian analysts that you and I both knew as well that that really sort of saw things our way, but they were powerless. And, um, you know, I I think there's, there's a couple of reasons why we're here with analysis. One, I don't think that command really knew what we had learned and knew how to use it. Because if you've got a tool, if, if you've got a hammer, you got to know how to hold which end of the hammer to hold and how to swing it in order to drive a nail. We were in, infinitely more complicated than, um, yeah, as human beings as well, but, <laughs> um, but infinitely more complicated than swinging a hammer. And command didn't know how to use it, so they didn't appreciate it. What they appreciated was the bigger, better pie chart. And, um, and then within the, course, the context of our community, there were people that didn't want to do the work. They didn't want to go outside. They were there for a reason. Some of them were outright there for an easy ride. You and I share more in common than I would care to discuss on camera. And I always enjoy our conversations. You've always been passionate about putting your all in policing. This has been a great interview, Rob. So any final words you'd like to say? Uh, I, I, wish, I wish the guys out on the job really well. I want to say this too. Um, just again, to qualify it, uh, I am a bigger fan of the job now that I've left the job. I'm a big fan of policing. There's the, I, I've got the, the blue line flag behind me. I actually I fly idea. one on the front of my house. Yeah. Um, uh, I've got, uh, this actually was just on the top of the, the pile of t-shirts today, but it's back the blue and, and I'm, I'm a big believer in policing and, and, and the idea of what that vocation was supposed to be and certainly was for us. Whether we did it right, whether we did it wrong, whether the things that we did back then would fly anymore today, um, but uh, but based on on the way that the politics are and the people that are in command in in a lot of places, um, it, it's and you know if if we ever get a chance to talk about disordered personalities and malignant personalities, when you take a look at at money and power and and what people will do to hold on to power, what they'll say, how they'll 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 sell their comrades out for power, um, I certainly don't believe that. The majority of police commanders are there for the right reason anymore. It's it's all about the power, and 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 playing the games of the political taskmasters. Um, and uh, I wish those coppers out there the best of luck. But um, for me, it came down to the fact that my altruistic altruistic sacrifice was not appreciated, was not wanted, and no longer worthy of the people that it was there for. That's me. Um, but you know, there, we did good things and it's nice to live them. And I I think there are some good teaching points in there. So thank you for the opportunity. Rob, thanks again for some of your time. I can always count on you to give me your candid views. Thank you, brother. That's Rob Tachty, retired police officer, crime analyst, and trusted friend. For more crime analysis resources, consider joining the IACA. 
You can also check out Don Reby on her Excellence in Analytics channel and Tribe of Excellence Facebook group. And make sure you check out Jason Elder's Law Enforcement Analysis podcast. You'll find the links to these great resources in the description below. If you found value in this video, make sure you smash that like button. Click that subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss any of our new episodes. See you next time.